So what I really wanted to do is tell you a story. I mean, uh, that's what I'm good at. I'm not really good at, uh, you know, giving you PowerPoints and other things. So it's it's really a story, and uh, I hope these things work because we had, we had a lot of technical gitch pitch to kind of get this done. But as I said, that uh, uh, once upon a bubble. So that's really where my story started way back in 1999. Uh, I was all of 22. And I had started this company when I was in school at 16 because I love playing games. And uh, uh, from 16 to about 21, 22, it was all fun and games. I used to make games for all kinds of people, have fun. It was really uh, not a serious business. It was a good hobby. But in 1999, it changed everything. Uh, some people came to me from a very odd company. They said, I'm, we are from Price Waterhouse something. I said, water supply company, I don't need them. They said, no, 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 we'll get you something called venture capital. I'd never heard of venture capital. I don't think so many people even now here have understood what venture capital is. So I said, sorry, sorry, I don't want any venture capital. This, and of course, you know, in India, everybody has been told one thing that kabhi loan mat lena. So I said, no, no, I don't want any loan. They said, no, 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 this is, not, this is something else. So they finally told me that venture capital is like a loan which you don't have to return back. <laughs> and uh, I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> that's what I need. And uh, without, I mean, without even, I did not know what stock meant, what fin balance sheets were or anything. These Price Waterhouse people made some very complex Excel sheets with formulas and everything else. And they told me, just go and meet these investors and rattle this out and s very confidently say these numbers. I did that. And within a matter of a month, I had three and a half crores in my bank. Think about that. And by the way, I still didn't know that what capital meant, what venture capital was. I just knew that my father was not and somebody is giving me three and a half crores to do what I love to do, which I would have done for free. So that's really how it started. And uh, as I said, it was a bubble. We did all the wrong things, right from hiring people from Pepsi Cola to uh, buying Honda City cars in the company's name to doing hiring ad agencies hiding MBAs, everything. We did every big mistake here and of course went bust. But I think, uh, sorry, uh, yeah. But I think what we really wanted to do was we wanted to reach the stars. I think that was the one thing that we wanted to do big things. And that is what kept us going. And the big thing for us was a one vision and one mantra that gaming is going to be bigger than Bollywood. Because all the other guys were like, you know, B Bollywood is really the industry, media, entertainment. I said, forget Bollywood. Gaming is going to be bigger. And that was the one mantra. And even if you ask anyone today, that's what we swear by. So our, our aim and goal was that gaming is going to become bigger than everything. It has already happened in US. It's already happened in Japan, Korea, China, Europe. Name any country. Gaming is the biggest entertainment business, actually, if you, from a standalone basis. And so will be games. And that really kept us going. And of course, we had to find the best talent to work for us. And uh, given that we were a startup and all the money had gone, uh, was almost bust, I think people come across this whole thing, then where do we find people? So of course, we could not afford people from IITs and all the top engineering colleges. What we could afford is people like this. Pretty much uh, right out of school, right out of the most rundown engineering colleges. but. What we saw was a lot of these people were very hungry and young and they wanted to, they were passionate about technology. I think that is really the key thing. So uh, if you really look at our team, uh, I, I proudly say that nobody is qualified to do their jobs. And I think these, though, these are the best people who can function and perform. Uh, believe me, there are many PhDs giving bhashans in colleges and universities and writing books and not running companies. So that's what, these were the real people who did it for us. And of course, uh, uh, we had to take a lot of risks. Uh, we had to swim with the sharks. Uh, suddenly we had Reliance coming in and all kinds of people coming in to compete with us and saying we'll destroy you and we have so much money and we have so much this and you are just a startup, what can you do? So every day we used to get death threats, our employees were offered double salary, triple salary. You know, so it is pretty much because we became the, the school of gaming in India. That's what we were. And uh, if you in fact look at uh, any gaming company in this country, uh, then you have to find a person who has worked for us at some point of time. So, I mean, we really became that institution. And, and we are proud of it. I mean, it's not something to be uh, sad about. And what happened is, with all the competition coming in, 
uh, clearly the challenge was what do we focus on and what do we do. And this was the time when we said, you know what, screw everything, online gaming is not working, we shut online gaming. We were the first company who actually started a dot-com site, uh, went all off and then shut it down. But we said, you know what, you're going to do mobile games. And I'm talking of 2002, 2003, when mobile phone had just been introduced, 16 rupees a minute call rate. It really, really sounded like a crazy idea that where people are, you know, not wanting to pay 16 rupees to make a call, we are saying that they're going to start paying, uh, paying money to play games. So it was, it was a tough challenge. But we had to do one thing, as I said, the superheroes always uh, save the day. So we had to be friends with the superhero. So to cut a long story short, what we did was we took the biggest risks of our life. Uh, we started developing games very early on the mobile platforms. Uh, it was our own games. They were very successful. So from almost zero, we went to like two crores in revenue in seven months uh, because of we launched some of our games. But the big thing for us was that how can we go to the next level? And we wanted a big brand. And that's when uh, we had to really take this one bet, and it was quite easy. I said, let's name all the superheroes, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man. And of course, we had to get Spider-Man. I remember going to New York, sitting with the Marvel Comics guys, convincing them that they should license uh, Spider-Man the brand to this unknown company from Mumbai, Bombay actually, not Mumbai, uh, who was wanting to make this game. It sounded very completely stupid to them and our investors were like, are you stupid, you want to do this? You should tell Marvel that we will make them the game at half the rate because that's what everybody is all about. Right? India may will do everything for half the rate. So I said, listen, this is, not Mar this is Marvel. They are not here to uh, go to a, a company who is going to do things at half the rate. They want to work with the best company in the world who can create the best game and make the most of it. So it was really that switch from creating or being an outsourcer or kind of the whole value proposition that I am cheap to a value proposition that we are world class. And I think that really, when of course, the other big problem was that we had to give every dollar in the company left to Marvel Comics to license that brand. Of course, uh, uh, as you know, that Spider-Man never, you know, always saves the day. We did create that game. And in 2004, it became one of the best selling games in the world. We were able to get it across every channel, every market, every language, and every platform. And our revenues, which were run, running in a few crores, went all the way to a few million dollars. I mean, just by this one Spider-Man. But I think uh, that comes the next thing, that uh, in 2004, uh, our investors, the guys who gave me three and a half crores, uh, who didn't know what they were doing, uh, had a very good, good time. In 2004, there's this company called Tom Online from China, came and paid cash. They paid about 16 times, you can do the math, to the investors in an all cash deal. And they wanted to buy out our investors. And of course, uh, some part of the management team did get an exit, but clearly it was too early for us. We were having a lot of fun. And we told Tom, well, we'll continue running this and we'll continue to grow and we will go to the next stage of our growth, which is even more exciting. And uh, that comes to, and we'll talk a little bit about it because I know everybody talks about exits and you'll keep hearing about this from VCs and other people that how exits are difficult and not happening. All I can tell you is that I have done three exits already. So we'll go to that later. So uh, we pretty much became one happy family. As I say, in 2004, uh, great time, we got, we got the funding, we got the cash, investors were out. Uh, the overall telecom market started booming. This is about the time, 2004, 2005, all the way to 2007, 2008, where the market was going to a completely different level. And we started up offices in, uh, in Beijing, in, uh, in uh, God knows what all places. Yeah, we were in Madrid, in London, in Los Angeles, and kind of went on a global spree to expand, and we got every character available to make into a game. So we licensed... Uh, Jurassic Park, Hulk, I mean, basically we went to Hollywood and bought every license which could we, we could get our hands on to create games in. But clearly the, the writing was on the wall that the global market was changing because you know the whole, uh, the big tsunami had hit international market which is Apple. So once Apple came in, the entire uh, gaming and telecom ecosystem across the world started crashing and that whole market started converting into Apple and later now Android. So we had to make another, another big turn on what do we do. And I think in 2007 we made another big thing which, where we said 
that screw international markets, we are only going to focus on India. And we are only going to create games and our entire IP strategy will become India. So before that, almost 80% of our revenue was international, 20% was India. But from 2007, we decided to change focus and said, you know what, India is our market. And that got us to our next juncture where we got uh, UTV, Cisco and Adobe who came into the company and of course Tom Online who had come in in 2004 uh, was happily exited and we had three sets of investors. Of course I'm sure you know UTV, they are the guys who make the best movies in the world uh, and in Bollywood. So we got a lot of Bollywood licenses. Uh, with Cisco and Adobe we got access to a lot of things which we could normally, we could normally not. Uh, but I think overall it was a very, very good setup with uh, the best of the technology world, the best of the IP world. And from 2007, we relentlessly focused on the India market. That's what we said. We started focusing on lower end phones, on, and on Java, uh, going all the way to series 30, series 40. Uh, we started creating games on cricket. IPL is one of our biggest franchise which we continue to create. Uh, every major Bollywood movie, uh, we were part of it, whether it is Gajini with, with Amir Khan or uh, Rawan with Shah Rukh Khan. So everyone was working with us and while the rest of the world was busy making games for iPhone and Android <laughs> and fighting in a completely different market, uh, we had a free ride pretty much uh, to grow and gain market share in India. And also remember, most of our competitors were people who had never ever played games before. So that gives you a very good advantage. These were people who had only read business plans and uh, seen investor slides and seen, oh wow, everybody is playing MMORPGs in China, let us launch MMORPGs in India. Uh, the complete disaster. I mean, uh, you know that India is actually a, a graveyard of dead game companies. Not because they didn't have the money or the people, it's just primarily because the people who run these companies had never played games. And unfortunately, uh, people continue to fund some of these companies, which is a, a different discussion. So we had a, a decent exit in 2007. And from 2007 to now, what we did was something exciting. So we pretty much became the biggest games company here from the, in India, from almost 60 to 70 percent market share. Uh, we recorded 200 million downloads only on one platform which was Nokia we announced a few months back. So pretty much, I mean, it was a great going. I think uh, uh, we were all having a great time in terms of uh, the team, what we were achieving, all the, all the cool stuff we were doing. And of course it does not, uh, you know, uh, opportunities keep coming all the way. And I think uh, something exciting happened last year, which we got, uh, as I say, we got the 100 million hug from Disney. Uh, last year, uh, early last year, uh, Disney acquired 100% of India games. Uh, in a, one of a very interesting transaction, which was, it was pretty much the first foray of Disney outside of the US. So they acquired UTV for the media, entertainment, television business, and they acquired us as a games entity. So that was actually a very, very interesting journey, and I really, really enjoyed it. But, as I said, <laughs> it was not all that simple. I, I wish the, the way I narrated the story to you is how uh, things normally end up and how things go. Uh, uh, we had to go through a lot of uh, 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 climaxes and dramas and scenes and, uh, and emotions. And I think that's really the journey. I think we keep talking about uh, you know, all the successes and all the great things we have done, but the question really is that uh, it does not happen that easily. And if you really look at uh, what happened, uh, you know, I say that the, the standard mode of a startup is to always be in a tailspin or to be in chaos. And that is exactly how we existed. If you entered our office or you spoke to anybody, uh, you would get a sense of chaos. And actually, that's really what kept us going. We always were paranoid. We were always thinking of what is the next big opportunity which we are going to do. However, that is different than being not focused. You need to be really seeing the market. So for example, when everybody and his dog was trying to launch MMORPGs from China and Korea, including Alok and other people from, uh, I think, Krida, Games 2, and then Japak. Uh, we did not spend one dollar on launching MMORPG games because, well, we knew that nobody in India wants to play these crappy Chinese games. In India, we were looking at the West a lot more. We were looking at World at Warcraft. We were looking for a lot more Western content. So when everybody was looking East, we were looking West. And it was almost like in our board meetings, investors telling me that, 
are you sure you know what you're doing? Are we missing the big boat? Are we missing this whole wave of MMORPGs? And certainly we did not do that because we exactly knew what the consumer wanted. So it's, it's different than being into a tailspin but being in control. And I think that's really a difficult part for a lot of the startups. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, we almost went bankrupt several times. And I think this is actually good because uh, too much money creates a lot of other problems. And I'm sure Bangalore is full of it with all the, uh, all the flips and flops and all the, uh, the e-commerce companies and everybody around here as well as around India, their biggest problem is that they're overcapitalized and they're starting venture capital funds. I mean, just imagine that. So, you know, when, when startup companies announce venture capital funds, you can imagine what is going on. Or I would say early stage companies. And unfortunately, some of the people over there versus uh, you being in a mode where you are constantly bankrupt. And of course, uh, uh, I really love being bankrupt and uh, I, I love ha ride, having free rides even here uh, from the airport to the, to the venues here. So I think it was, it was an interesting thing, but I think this teaches you one very important thing when you're almost bankrupt, that the people who are with you who are staying are the most important people. When you're willing to pay people market salaries and give them all kinds of food and accessories and uh, massages in your office, everybody wants to work for you. But when you don't have money to pay, when you are in a difficult time, but you have a very, very passionate team, a great goal, an amazing set of uh, environment and culture, the people who stick to you are the people who are most valuable and actually those are the people you should applaud for. That's the kind of people you want. And I think that's really tough. We were bullied by everybody. Being a startup is like being this little kid in college which gets bullied by everybody. Whether it is the operators, whether it is big companies, VCs used to bully us. Hey, please come here and present the market. My some partners have come from America. They want to understand the market. So I don't know. I may have made hundreds of presentations to people just to educate them for the market. It almost became like we had become this, uh, like this little company in their tour that anybody who comes from Intel or Google or Microsoft has to come visit your office and you have to give them some gyan and for no reason and no and complete waste of time. In fact, to, to an extent that we now started telling companies that only if you are having a revenue opportunity for us and you can commit some revenue, we are going to meet any of your people. And I'm talking about big companies. So, Please beware of companies who are just calling you to keep making presentations. They're doing it just to entertain themselves and not adding any, any value to you. Or tell their bosses how well connected they are in the market. Uh, so, you know, it is, it is tough. And a lot of people either get too scared or intimidated. Believe me, every big media company over here thinks they can beat you and they can put more money and more advertising and more radio ads and more TV ads and kill your business. That's, that's how big media companies think. And when you meet them, that's the way they want to bully you. They want to chest thump and show you their power. I have one word for you to tell them, fuck off. Because that's what happens. If they could do this, they would not be where they are. Believe me, tell me one media company here who's successful in any of the new ventures. Zilch. And that's purely because they do, not get this, they do not get this medium at all. And I think your biggest power is that you are fast and nimble, which they are not. So don't try to get int intimidated. Same thing is with the operators. I think they're equally bad. Uh, of course, they are now <laughs> dead, so you don't have to worry about them uh, anymore. So uh, don't waste your time presenting to mobile operators or running behind them. Completely irrelevant. So there was a time when they were a big part of the ecosystem. Uh, well, um, other big issues. People, product, process, and scale. So I think uh, as a startup, when you're just small and you know, four or five people, it's a different thing. But the minute you start becoming bigger, uh, you start getting these, uh, these key problems of, uh, of people and everything else. And I think uh, I remember the days when every person who used to leave the company, we used to take it very personally. That we hired you, we give you this, we give you that. And you know, every loss was taken very personally. From there, we have now reached a stage where we started working on making sure that people are replaceable. But at the same time, we had to make sure that morale was very, very high. So uh, to give you an interesting stat, uh, what is the standard attrition rate in IT companies? Bangalore is the hub of it, right? 25%, 40%, I don't know what the number is. Sorry? 25%, whatever, let's take a number. That, that excludes the 25% who are in the bench playing table tennis. So um, in a market like, in, a, in the games market, 
where these people are very, very expensive or in general very, very in demand, there were three things. We were the lowest paymasters. Uh, we were the most sought out company if anybody wanted to set up. And clearly the thirdly, our attrition rate was only 8%. Only 8%. And the reason was very simple, that nobody wanted to leave us because they were having fun. And believe me, it's not about the money, it's not about all the other things, it's really about fun. And if people enjoy that, if they're loving what they're doing, they will work for you. And of course, it, it definitely helped us that about 27 of these people made anything from $50,000 to a few million dollars. So that's a different story. But that happened only later. It didn't happen before. So I think uh, scale is a big issue. And I think uh, we can have a full day talking about challenges around scale. Uh, of course, <laughs> the other thing is speeding at, at, as I said, empty tank. Speeding is very, very easy. But speeding at en empty tank is really the challenge. I remember I used to have a little bike or a scooter, Bajaj Chetak, and I had almost figured out that even though the petrol was in reserve, how I could actually go from destination A to B. I figured that out. And of course, then go there and find my dad or somebody and take some more money and get some more fuel. So I think startups are all about that. It's about speeding because you can't be slow. I mean, the worst thing which I hear a lot of startups do is saying, oh, I only have 10 lakhs, so I'll do things slowly and, you know, I'll kind of scale slowly and I'll, have, I'll hire one programmer after 10 months because I want to accrue from profits. So that's one way of doing business, but you won't be surviving long to do anything. The clear thing is how can you achieve speed? So clearly, I mean, we, we talk about Jugaad a lot, but it is not just about Jugaad, it's about smart Jugaad. It's about how can you make your customers pay for it? So a lot of times, uh, we figured out that if you had a valuable asset, you could go to a customer and say, you know what, pay me in advance. Pay me a minimum guarantee. So a lot of times, believe me, there were no VCs before. How companies used to get funding was companies giving them advance. And that culture, I just don't understand. People have all kinds of HR software. And my point is, if you can't convince five people to pay you one, like one lakh or 50,000 advance, then you don't even have a great product versus running behind some kind of a VC to get funding. So of course, uh, that's a different discussion. But as I said, uh, this is an art and some science. And I think you have to really figure that out. And of course, uh, as I said, keep the team motivated. You have to keep the dance going on, however good or bad the time is. And uh, I remember that we actually used to, uh, in our little office, we had a dance zone. We actually called it the dance zone. And after 6 in the evening, there was loud music and everybody could dance. As simple as that. But more importantly, what happens is that the people over here, uh, when they are working, they are not working. Because they could have got, if they wanted a job, they could have gone to uh, all these software companies, the Wipro Infosys types, uh, all these you know, call centers. I mean, today, if you are a young person in India, it's very difficult to be unemployed. You have to be really bad. Uh, you have to be really bad to not have a job. So, so the question is that in a market like this, how do you make people work for you? So that's how you need to really look at. And uh, at the same time, as I said, people are not necessarily, uh, the times has changed where you want to have a government job and this and that. People are now looking at a lot of options. And it's a great time for you to really, really sell your dream. So if young people like to dance with, the, you know, Aishwarya Rai, you better sell them that dream rather than trying to tell them that I'm going to give you some pizza or some Pepsi, which they anyway have. So you need to really figure this out. That's really the question. The big thing which happened was also this. Uh, so by the way, what happened is around the 25-40 range is one event, which is uh, Disney acquiring us. And of course, I think this number has now gone even higher. So. Uh, I think India may now have close to, I would say between, I'll make a guess, between 150 to 200 companies. Gaming is really the next frontier. It's really taking off uh, with the smartphone growth and everything else. And of course, uh, as you know, I've sold my company. <laughs> so uh, it's a tough world to be. So uh, what am I doing next is the question a lot of people ask me. And I was really, really, really thinking a lot about it. And I can tell you that. I'm not starting an incubator or uh, an angel fund, uh, <laughs> clearly. And I think the simple reason is that today the problem with incubation and angel funding model really is that 
it's garbage in, garbage out. The entrepreneurs are going to VCs and asking them, what will you fund? VCs say, you know what, e-commerce is hot, so why don't you build reverse logistic, forward logistic, side logistic, left logistic, payment, payment collection. I think I'll fund it. So the ecosystem around e-commerce. So suddenly, uh, lo whole behold, you know, there was every second company you met was doing this. And then suddenly one uh, VC had some problem with his sex life, and you had all these sex toy companies, lingerie companies, and you know, I don't know, today only I was pitched with another company. So my point is that, well, I'm not sure, I'm sure these ideas are valuable, but the market, does the market need it or some VC told you to do this? I don't understand. So if the ideas fundamentally are not that good, whether you incubate it or excubate it, they will, the output won't be that good. Uh, and angel funding, I think uh, uh, there's a good word we were discussing today, that angel funds are men's kitty parties. So when you go there, please realize that these are bored men with a lot of money. Uh, they don't understand your business. They want to probably give you 5, 10 lakhs, or so 5 lakhs is the sweet spot. Uh, a lot of these guys don't even understand. They're just here because they want to tell their other friends that they are an angel investor. There are a few alphas in these angel groups, and the alpha says, I like this guy, and then everybody's like, oh, 5 lakhs, 2 lakhs, 3 lakhs, and that's how they fund companies. And they have 25 people, 20 people, funding companies, completely ridiculous. But it's fun. So if you had seen Bheja Fry, that's the kind of scenario of, of angel funding over here. And remember, every time you're pitching to them, you are the guy on the other end. <laughs> so, so the model is broken, guys. Uh, I, I have great respect for some of the individuals there, but clearly, the whole idea of angel funding is how can you help entrepreneurs, how can you motivate them, how can you mentor them. I can bet you 15 men who give you 3 lakhs cannot mentor you. So I don't want to do that clearly. And of course, there's other very interesting theory which I say that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. So what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm, going to, I'm not afraid to die, so I'm becoming an entrepreneur. So, uh, so that's what I'm doing. That will be my next company coming up soon. So no more announcements today on the company, but that's, it's, it's that clear for me. And I think it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. I think I'm glad that you're here. I hope there are not too many VCs over here. If you are here, I'm sorry. I was just saying this randomly. I didn't mean it at all. Uh, but if you're an entrepreneur, this is the best time to be an entrepreneur. There's a lot of money available. A lot of uh, men's who, men who don't know what to do with their money. <laughs> and maybe some women too. Uh, and uh, the problem is ideas. So I think uh, clearly you need to focus on ideas which are uh, not about sex toys, but which is really about real problems which can be solved. And uh, uh, I know there's a sex toy guy here. If you are, just put your hands up. I'm not funding you, sorry. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's not about sex toys. So coming back to a few commandments, I thought, you know, the simple way to tell you is, you know, and I know uh, the guys at, uh, uh, at Vatican has, have done it really well. Everybody knows it. So I thought, let me just put together a list of 10 commandments if you have to remember this or kind of uh, take through this to kind of uh, go forward. So the simple one is this. <laughs> that I have heard so many people saying that I have the next billion dollar idea, but Vishal, only if you fund me 10 lakhs will I leave my job and start this. So dude, who has bigger balls, me or you? And then, I mean, that's the crazy part, right? I mean, people are having big ideas, but they don't have the guts to, or the courage to take the first step. And that is what is really required. We just heard Kailash, right? I mean, he was in Pune in 1993. It used to take eight hours from, to go from Bombay to Pune. It was not even connected, you know, technically. Of course, it's a different thing that it takes now the same time from Bangalore airport here. Uh, <laughs> but imagine, so he was in Bangalore airport and I was in Bangalore. And that's how far we were, and all the odds were against him, and you know, he could have done hundreds of other things, because that was not the traditional thing to do, but he had the balls to do antivirus, and that's where he is today. So that is what is missing, and guys, please grow them. Uh, I think the second thing is about relationships. I think the problem right now is that we look at everything as a transaction. I send you an email, you didn't reply to me, I hate you, you are bad. Uh, you know, I sent you a LinkedIn request and you have not accepted it. And you know, people have started taking relationship as transactions. Relationships are not like this, guys. Believe me, uh, I'm talking about eras before Facebook and all these things existed. We did one social network and that was meeting people and talking to them. Uh, so I think you need to do that a lot more. Get out, 
meet people and a lot of times things don't happen that very moment. You just don't come with a plan, present and the guy says no and you say this guy doesn't understand it. You know, it's a, it's a process, it takes time, there's chemistry developing, maybe you can come after six months and say these are the five things I changed and now you may like my idea. So it clearly depends on that and once you start looking at relationships, they are going to play a much bigger role because people move and people change. So a lot of times, so some of the people I knew in 1999 and 2000 and 2003 are now in different places and completely different equations and just because I told them I didn't like them that time didn't help me. So people change a lot and they can help you. So figure out, it's not about me giving you money or you giving me money or I buying your product. It's about how can we develop a relationship and very, very important. Of course, uh, I've, I've said that enough that let's focus on real pain points. I think, uh, uh, you know, India has, is a land of opportunities. You need to figure out what is the opportunity. Think about Red Bus. What they did was they figured out a pain point of, of booking bus tickets. It was not a sexy thing to do. Nobody in Europe or US was doing it. And if there is one thing which I would wa want DOT and Department of Government and everybody to ban is tech crunch. I think they are doing more harm to startups in India than anybody else because people need tech crunch and want to do the same thing here. But they don't understand that these are two different contexts. We are talking about a completely different market scenario. And what we really need is looking at localized problems, what is the challenge and figuring it out. And uh, unfortunately, not too many people are doing that. But it's very easy to do also. I mean, it's easy to course correct if you're still here and you're listening. And of course, uh, this is the one thing which I also realized that if you're not number one or number two, there is no reason for you to exist. It's as simple as that. Now, you can define your market segment. I'm not saying that you have to be number one or number two in the world. But Mota Mota, if you're not number one or number two in India, in your defined segment, and if you're not number one or global, these are really the two measures. And if anybody, if you have to be valuable, I'm not saying whether, you know, if somebody wants to invest in you, buy you, you want to go public, IPO, etc. These are really the, the few parameters. So really there is no point on being the uh, 115th uh, payment collections company or you know whatever the next uh, competitor which wants to copy free charge um, so there's no point in that their market leaders already established and of course you can't copy India games we are the leaders there so no need for game companies here so uh, I think that's really key and I think once you are able to identify a big enough segment where you have a clear shot on becoming this I think that's value creative and I think that's really what worked for us. Other thing is focus on 20%. I think uh, this is something which people don't understand a lot. Uh, that if you really want to succeed in anything, there are 20% of the things which will get you 80% of the results. And as a startup, you do not have the time to focus on the 80% of the things. So better is focus on the most important things which can show traction. So let's say for example, for a startup, what is most important is traction. So figure out what are the 20% or the most important things I need to do and focus on that rather than doing everything under the sun and spreading yourself very, very thin. And of course, this is different for different businesses, but I have seen that work a lot for us and maybe it could work for you. And of course, uh, <laughs> uh, why, why, why are you laughing? So. Uh, I know uh, Alok and I have always been uh, uh, criticized and hated and uh, uh, trolled on why we don't like MBAs. It's not that I don't like MBAs. It's just that MBAs don't like me. And they don't understand how I think. And they don't understand how startups think. And they don't understand, um, there are exceptions to every rule. So there are some smart MBAs too. So let me caveat it by that. But the problem really is that the whole education system, and, if you, and I would request you to go to uh, TED.com and uh, see a very interesting talk where they talk about the whole education system was designed to feed the bureaucracy. So MBA schools were made so that people could join all these FMCG companies. That's because they said let's outsource our education. Uh, the government sector, a lot of bureaucrats wanted to come in so that's how the education system was designed around that. So they said that for these functions we need some core skills, how do we get them? So we are still following a lot of that education system. And that whole system defines boxes and all kinds of things and tells you this is how things work. 
but the problem really is that uh, we are by definition in the in a disruptive world and the core definition of disruption is creativity and chaos and these are the two things which if you talk to people who are highly educated uh, uh, unless you are uh, doing this nuclear physics or something uh, they won't like it uh, and of course uh, sorry uh, spreadsheet makers people who spend a lot of time on spreadsheets guys that's not the way to run businesses you run businesses by talking to people talking to your consumers being in the market unless you are you know a vc or you know your job probably somehow involves uh, you know paying a lot of license fee to microsoft or getting more pirated software excel is another thing which we should be banned from startups because people spend too much time intellectually masturbating over these numbers <laughs> just go and do it you know go and do it whatever your theory is go see if it works and come back rather than oh what is going to happen in the fifth year and what is going to happen in 2014 when there are 400 million subscribers but only x million have smartphones i mean we spend too much time discussing about this and we don't do business so i think all what i did was i had a different team to deal with it so we had one set of people who were our spreadsheet makers whose job was to keep feeding our investors all this data because see they come from the financial world they understand this language they don't understand your language so the way you have to think about it is that that this is like uh, like you write a tweet and somebody reads that tweet makes it into an excel sheet that sends to your investors so that's how you need to really look at information and don't spend too much time on it and of course uh, it's about it's time to celebrate failures and enjoy the journey as i said you're going to have more failures than successes and if you start being dukhi and sad and grumpy about every every failure your employees look at that and they say ki what you know i mean what did i do matlab itna galat ho gaya because people are looking at you and if they see that you are getting depressed and you know failure is not taken kindly to that makes people take less risk and that in turn makes the organization a lot more babu where they either do yes sir and they'll do it with you so the idea is let everybody do ideas let's fail and if we are failing no problem here we'll succeed again Let, let us like the learnings and i think that's a very important part of the culture of how can you do that this is a tough thing but uh, we somehow figured out a way to do that uh, i also called it uh, endless loop so we used to go in a car and keep driving keep driving so there was our endless loop celebration and we used to keep talking and discussing it and people they used to like it because mine was a better car than theirs so um, of course the other thing is though that you shall not want to sell so uh, this is a little bit of a different story but i can tell you that in every exit which we were doing we were not sellers in the market we were actually either trying to buy the investors or try to raise money we were never out to sell the company and believe me when you are not wanting to sell is when people want to really buy you so a lot of people who who come and articulate in their first slide that my aim is to sell the company <laughs> sorry guys the party is over even before it started so clearly uh, you have to build it like it's your own it is it's your own kid you're not you're not growing your kid so that you give it away to somebody else right you're not but of course they get married and things happen but uh, you know you're not doing with that intention you are really wanting to stay with them and i think that's really something which worked for me and of course uh, uh, another big one that thou shall be fit i think the one regret i have in my startup years is that i did not pay so while i was a volleyball player and athlete and blah 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 i did not pay enough attention to my health of course i am reversing that and i am in a in a major journey of transforming myself but i really see uh, a lot of people who who are not keeping as fit as they can and believe me the only asset you really come with when you are born and you are going to go with is your body and if you are not fit both from mind and body you cannot operate a company there is no use of having a billion dollars and then eating boiled vegetables with uh, a uh, like an iv attached to you that's not the life you want to go so clearly focus on that start any kind of activities because in the startup world this is what people keep at the back seat but believe me that's wrong and you need to focus on it as much as possible and of course uh, the last point i want to end with a with a story uh, which i started with Uh, which is all about this wall so uh, there was a guy who wanted to build a wall and of course uh, being a smart guy from a big company he asked three people to you know come and build this wall for him 
The first guy, of course, he had a budget and a time frame and everything else. The first guy built the wall in 30 days, on budget, perfect quality, on time, and delivered the wall. And he really liked the wall. The second guy delivered the same wall in 25 days, equal quality, uh, but much faster. That is impressive. And there was a third guy who built the wall in 10 days. And his wall was the most beautiful, the highest, better than their quality expectations. And this guy just didn't understand that how could he get these three different results with the same task. So he of course called all these three people. The first gentleman uh, came and said, what did you do? Tell me how did you make this wall? And his simple answer was, you know what, you told me to make a wall, I had the design of the wall. I went and I hired 300 workers and laborers, called them. I had one supervisor uh, and a taskmaster, and he drove these 300 people day in and day out to make sure that they deliver, and they deliver on quality and cost and time. And of course, the wall was made, and you can see exactly to your specification. And by the way, I made a 10% profit, and I'm very happy about it. I said, well, good enough. He went to the other guy, and he said, what is your story? How did you build this wall in 25 days? So this guy was a little MBA type, so he said, you know what? I know about quality and processes and systems, so I got a bunch of people to do planning for me. I got all these managers, I created all these hierarchies, quality department, and we had not 300, but maybe 200 people, but I had a lot of high quality executives. And they planned and did everything else, and we delivered five days ahead of schedule, and we also delivered more or less uh, exactly same quality. But you know what? I had a, I had, we actually made a loss. And we made a loss because we think we are a big company and we think your account is good and we value it. So we believe that you're going to give us more business and uh, that's how we are going to continue working. So that is the story of the second guy. So the story of the third guy, it was interesting when he came about. He simply said that, what was your secret and how did you do this? The first thing he said is that, I have never made a wall in my life. That was the first thing. And I never had the money to even make the wall. So when you gave me this contract, I was super excited and super thrilled because I had something to do, something meaningful to do. Of course, I didn't have the money, so I went and found 10 other people who also were equally broke, equally didn't have the money, equally didn't know what to do, and I told them that there is this very, very evil dragon who's here. And uh, there is a task assigned to build a wall which is going to make sure that the dragon is captured and is on the other side. And it's very important that the wall is very good because if the dragon escapes, it can destroy humanity. So it's really, really challenging. And I have been interested with this task of creating this wall to save the dragon, to save the world from the dragon. And uh, the other thing is that people who are going to work with me are going to go in history because if we make this wall and the dragon stays, everybody will know you did it. And if it doesn't stay, it will still go that you were the idiots who didn't do it. <laughs> so, you know, you can be famous. And finally he said that we are also going to make sure that our names are written on this wall somewhere, in small font. But the idea being that it's an amazing thing. Let's slay this dragon and let's save the world. And those 10 people got so motivated in the task of slaying the dragon and in the task of being famous and in the task of changing the world that they figured out how to make the wall, they did everything under the sun, begged, borrowed and steal and made that wall in 10 days and certainly made the most beautiful and the highest profit margin ever. So clearly, I think the, the key to this story is exactly this, that you can only, only win with passion. And I think uh, it's, it's really tough, guys, but it's also very simple. It's about how can you motivate a small set of people to submit one thing to you, that is the passion. And if you look at Instagram, if you look at Facebook, if you look at all success stories, they were all the people who were setting out to make the third wall. They did not have the resources, they did not have the, the same amount of money or the uh, management MBAs like the first and the two guys, but they had the one thing which was most important. And I think, uh, the good thing is that each one of you over here has the potential to do it. I think the problem is that you have to find the right dragon. 
and believe me india has a country full of dragons i mean there's a dragon everywhere this dragon probably below the stage right now so focus on the right problem the right dragon motivate your people to do it and i think that's going to change the world thank you